Um, first one is from Isaiah 29. I'm um, reading from the NIV version. If you want to look, it should be on the screen. The Lord says, These people come near to me with their mouth and honour me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. Their worship of me is based on merely human rules they have been taught. Therefore, once more I will astound these people with wonder upon wonder. The wisdom of the wise will perish. The intelligence of the intelligent will vanish. Woe to those who go to great depths to hide their plans from the Lord. Who do, their, who do their work in darkness and think, who sees us? Who will know? You turn things upside down as if the potter were thought to be like the clay. Shall what is formed say to the one who formed it, you did not make me? Can the pot say to the potter, you know nothing? In a very short time, will not Lebanon be turned into a fertile field and the fertile field seem like a forest? In that day, the deaf will hear the words of the scroll, and out of gloom and darkness the eyes of the blind will see. Once more the humble will rejoice in the Lord, the needy will rejoice in the Holy One of Israel, the ruthless will vanish, the mockers will disappear, and all who have an eye for evil will be cut down, those who, who with a word make someone out to be guilty, who ensnare the defender in court, and with false testimony deprive the innocent of justice. Therefore, this is what the Lord, who redeemed Abraham, says to the descendants of Jacob. No longer will Jacob be ashamed. No longer will their faces grow pale. When they see among their children the work of my hands, they will keep my holy name. Sorry, they will keep my name holy. They will acknowledge the holiness of the Holy One of Jacob and will stand in awe of the God of Israel. Those who are wayward in spirit will gain understanding. Those who complain will accept instruction. The second reading is from 1 Corinthians 1, 18, 18 to 2, no, verse 5. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved it is the power of God. For it is written... I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, the intelligence of the intelligent I will frustrate. Where is the wise person? Where is the teacher of the law? Where is the philosopher of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of, the wo of God, the world through its wisdom did not know him, God was pleased through the foolishness of what was preached to save those who believe. Jews demand signs and Greeks look for wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles, but to those whom God has called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than human wisdom and the weakness of God is stronger than human strength. Brothers and sisters, think of what you were when you were called. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many were influential. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. God chose the lowly things of this world and the despised things and the things that are not to nullify the things that are so that no one may boast before him. It is because of him that you are in Christ Jesus who has become for us wisdom from God, that is, our righteousness, holiness and redemption. Therefore, as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. And so it was with me, brothers and sisters. When I came to you, I did not come with eloquence or human wisdom as I proclaimed to you the testimony about God. For I resolved to know nothing while I was with you except Christ Jesus, Jesus Christ, and him crucified. I came to you in weakness with great fear and trembling. 
my message and my preaching were not with wise and persuasive words, but with a demonstration of the Spirit's power, so that your faith might not rest on human wisdom, but on God's power. Let's pray together as we come to look at God's word. We thank you, Lord, for your word. Please help us now to hear it, to understand it, and to take it to heart. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Yoko Ono is the uh, Japanese-American artist who famously married the Beatle John Lennon in 1969. Uh, many of us will be old enough to remember that. Uh, you may know she was blamed by many for breaking up the Beatles, though I suspect it was never uh, really that simple. But anyway, she once produced a book. I got a feeling it was called Grapefruit, but it was a book of poetry and art. And uh, it had this instruction printed inside the cover. Burn this book after you've read it. Which uh, led a few to comment she was just one step ahead of the critics. Um, now, whether or not it deserved to be burnt is a matter for others to argue about. But it's an interesting kind of disclaimer to open with. Normally, we think it's not a good thing to begin with an apology. If I get up and say, I'm sorry, this sermon's not going to be very good, that'll really get you on the edge of your seats, won't it? So what do we make of the Apostle Paul's words here in 1 Corinthians chapter 1? Because when you think about it, the Bible reading we've just had could be taken to be something like, one, yeah, look, our message sounds foolish. You probably do look like an idiot if you believe it. And two, yes, it's true that hardly anyone of any consequence actually believes it. So it doesn't look all that attractive. And not only that, but three, those who proclaim it aren't that flash either. We're a pretty boring lot. Is this maybe Paul's way of trying to be on the front foot when the inevitable criticism comes, that this whole Christianity thing looks a bit pathetic? Well, maybe there's some element of that in it, but, you know, and it's good to be honest and realistic in discussion about how things look. But that's far from being all that it is, and indeed it's not even the main thing that it is. Rather than being some sort of apology, these are deliberate and quite important points that the Apostle makes, profound comments uh, on the nature of Christian ministry and all that we're involved in as a church. I don't know how often you take time to stop and think about church, whether it's church in general or our church in particular the sort of things that we do together but here's what God's word has to say about the nature of church and Christian ministry it's a fundamentally foolish enterprise that's looking at it um, purely from a human point of view of course but Christian ministry the task we're engaged in together is a fundamentally foolish enterprise as commonly happens in Paul's letters, uh, and especially so in this first letter to the Corinthians, the discussion is sparked by the believers there starting to drift off course. And the key to understanding uh, what we're reading is where we finished last time. Paul wrote in verse 17, Christ did not send me to baptise, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom and eloquence, lest the cross of Christ be emptied of its power. Those final words are the critical ones. Lest the cross of Christ be emptied of its power. But that only begs the question, how, how can something I do result in the cross of Christ being emptied of its power? I mean, I can't change events in the past. Jesus died on the cross, that's a fact. Nothing I can do or not do will change that. Surely the cross either has power or doesn't have power regardless of anything you or I might do. What Paul means though is that the Corinthians, and we can do this as well, that the Corinthians might begin to think about and talk about the gospel of Jesus Christ in such a way that moves the focus off the cross. Now whether that's deliberate or inadvertent, either way, if it happens, we'll mislead one another. More significantly, we'll mislead those who are not yet believers about what God has done for us 
and uh, the basis on which we can be right with him. For example, if we lose our clarity about the cross of Christ, even if only in subtle emphasis, then one problem is we'll simply not tell people what they need to hear. Or another possibility will be trying to adjust the message to make it sound more attractive. Or, and this, this seems to be nearer the problem in Corinth, we can start to think it's all about us. Aren't we clever for believing it? Who wouldn't want to join our church because we're such a great bunch of people? Or the flip side of that, which is to make too big a deal of the one proclaiming the message, either the person or the technique. If only we can find a persuasive speaker, or if only we can get the presentation right, then we'll have them flocking in. People are going to turn to Christ in droves. No, no, Paul says as soon as you start thinking that way, you're missing something important. The truth is, and we've mentioned it already, Christian ministry is a fundamentally foolish enterprise from a human point of view. It depends entirely on God's power for even a smidgen of success. But get this, and this is really the important part of this, God has deliberately chosen it that way. He's deliberately chosen a foolish message. He calls ordinary people and uses very ordinary messengers so that the cross of Christ will be right at the centre and so no one might boast. In other words, that no one can suggest it's all to do with their personal brilliance. Uh, I want to take a few moments in turn on each of these. So in a moment, uh, we're going to have three headings, the message, the recipients, and the preacher. We'll come to that uh, shortly, but first a quick reminder of some things Steve mentioned last time about the city of Corinth. Um, it's strategically ro located right at the... Uh, the intersection of the northern and southern parts of Greece, just on that narrow strip of land, which is known as the Isthmus of Corinth. It's very difficult to say that. Um, because of that, it had traffic in all directions, north-south traffic across land, east-west as uh, cargo was carried from one side to the other between ships. Now, that made it a very cosmopolitan sort of place. And like any city that's got travellers going through it in all directions, it had its... Uh, its share of you know, red light and rather sleazy aspects as well. Possibly not much worse than other cities, but it did have a bit of a reputation. Paul had spent 18 months there, which is actually a long time compared to other places that he ministered. But one of the interesting things uh, about when you read the book of Acts, it, we don't pick this up because we don't really know the geography and the the place names are just names to us they sort of we don't understand where they all connect but Paul actually seems to have chosen strategic places to minister and uh, this is a good example because if the gospel can take hold in a place like Corinth with so much movement going on through it then people are likely to take the news all over the place and, and even if they possibly don't believe it themselves. I mean, it's not too hard to imagine someone saying, you know, when I was in Corinth, I heard this guy speaking about a man who'd been crucified and who was seen alive again afterwards. And so even if they don't believe it themselves, the, the kind of the, the ideas start to spread out um, and easily uh, can do that from a place like Corinth. So Paul had evidently considered his time there well worth it. But as we heard last time, some issues had arisen in the church and so he writes to push back against some of the uh, errors as well as to answer some questions. So um, let's turn to these three headings. First of all, the message, and you can see there that's uh, from verses 18 to 25. And so what he says is the message of the cross is what? Profound, <laughs> majestic, transcendent? No, foolishness. Yes, to those of us who are being saved, it's the power of God. God has opened our eyes, turned us around. It looks sensible to us. But think about it from a purely human point of view. God sent his son into the world, but this son was executed as a criminal. What's that got going for it? A reasonable person is going to expect that a God who has anything going for him will be honoured, not executed. From a purely human point of view, Jesus looks like a loser from the outset. Who will want to be interested in a crucified Messiah? 
in Paul's day, as he knew well enough, different audiences valued different things. Trouble is, none of them found this message compelling. Jews demand signs, presumably something spectacular, something miraculous. Greeks look for wisdom. Well, tough luck for both of them. The Jews will have to get their mind around uh, a Messiah who's cursed by God because the scriptures are clear, Deuteronomy 21. Anyone who is hung on a pole is under God's curse. How can that make sense? Both Messiah and cursed by God. So, of course, it's a stumbling block to them, to the Greeks, or if you like, to anyone who, who doesn't have a particular interest in the Old Testament scriptures. They're not worried about this being cursed business. They just think the whole thing sounds silly. A God who's executed and who died? Who came up with that? I'm sure the believers in Corinth were very enthusiastic about coming to know Jesus and it came out. But in all that enthusiasm, they were glossing over the cross and forgetting about the offence that it caused. A stumbling block to Jews. Outright foolishness to others. But don't try and tidy it up. It's God's message and deliberately chosen that way. But it isn't the message alone which appears foolish because God's deliberately chosen the recipients, verses 26 to 31. Uh, Now, don't take Paul as being intentionally unkind here, but he says, take a look in the mirror. What can you lot claim by human standards? Wisdom? Influence? Nobility? Maybe some could, but not many of you. We live in a world where celebrities often set the mark, but only a handful of prominent people claim to be Christian. God doesn't, you know, go out of his way to choose the people on the covers of magazines or the ones with the most popular YouTube channel or whatever it might be. They're not excluded, but they're not common. It's so tempting to think that if lots of prominent people, lots of fashionable people, perhaps even prime ministers were Christians, then everyone would want to join them. doesn't work that way, though, does it? It's always foolishness until God changes our hearts and opens our eyes. A handful of Christians may be prominent and influential, but most of us don't stand out, and that's exactly the way God has chosen it. God chose the foolish things of the world, the weak things of the world, the lowly and despised things of the world. Why? So that no one may boast before him. Every aspect of our faith is God's work, not ours. Now, the Corinthians may have even worked out that they were nothing all that special themselves, but they were getting carried away about their favourite teachers. So as well as the message and the recipients, Paul has something to say about the preacher. And this is from the start of chapter 2. When I came to you, I did not come with eloquence or human wisdom, as I proclaimed to you the testimony about God. For I resolved to know nothing while I was with you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. I came to you in weakness, with great fear and trembling. My message and my preaching were not with wise and persuasive words, but with a demonstration of the Spirit's power, so that your faith might not rest on human wisdom, but on God's power. I personally don't think there's any good reason to think Paul was an unusually poor communicator. In fact, more likely the opposite. I'd hazard a guess he was quite a good speaker. This is all about style. His point is that he deliberately avoided the rhetoric and the flourish of the philosophers and the debaters of his day, uh, choosing to keep the gospel plain and unadorned. Uh, We're hearing a lot about the influence of social media uh, just at present, uh, with uh, one of the issues being that people get swept up by impressive presentation and they don't think about the truth or otherwise of the content. Well, that problem's been around for at least a couple of thousand years. What Paul's getting at is that all the focus needed to be on the message, on the cross, 
and not on the presentation. And by the way, it's not that Paul was opposed to persuading people uh, or debating with them. If you look at Acts 17, you'll see that in Thessalonica, Paul went to the synagogue and reasoned with them from the scriptures, explaining and proving that the Messiah had to suffer and to rise from the dead. He was all for uh, lively debate, but to jazz up the message in fancy style so that people are more excited by the preacher and his words is to move the focus off the cross and risk emptying the cross of its power. Of course, you can go to the other extreme and make the presentation woeful. <laughs> I don't think that's the conclusion we're meant to come to. Uh, I sometimes wonder when I see obscure Christian messages on billboards or, or uh, posters or, you know, you drive past some place in the country and there's a, a, you know, a Bible verse in archaic language up, and you think, uh, is this helping to make the message clear, really? Um, you know, God can use even the strangest of things to bring people to faith, but the Bible's not pushing us to be obscure. If anything, be the opposite, be clear. But wise and persuasive words are not the key to success. My message and my preaching were not with wise and persuasive words, but with a demonstration of the Spirit's power, so that your faith might not rest on human wisdom, but on God's power. No matter how gifted the preacher, no matter how clever the talk, it's always foolishness, unless God changes our hearts and opens our eyes. So this passage is really all about getting our thinking right about the gospel. Programs are good, but on their own they won't make a difference. Presentation's important. But presentation alone can't open the eyes of the blind. And this affects everything we do as a church. Uh, if we start to imagine that we're such a great bunch, and we are, I'm not suggesting otherwise, but if we start to imagine the gospel will flourish in Gerringong all because we're so great, then I'm afraid we're deluding ourselves. People will only come to faith through the power of God in their lives, opening their eyes and bringing them to new birth. So that what appears to human eyes to be a foolish message suddenly makes sense. It means that we need to keep the cross, that is the message of Christ crucified, at the centre of all we do. And if it all depends on God's power, then we need to pray and keep asking God to change people's hearts so they can grasp the truth of the gospel. Perhaps this is a good time to mention that next Saturday morning is our monthly prayer meeting, just here in the hall at 8 o'clock for an hour. If we believe what the scriptures say to us here, then prayer will absolutely be the key. Pray that God will save people so that to them the message about the cross will no longer be foolishness but become the power of God.